not so good one. Is, is, this, a good, is this a good one? Yes, that's a good one. <laughs> Thank you very much for that song. Taste the Lord and see his good. He will provide. Amen. Praise the Lord. Chile. Uh, my wife's parents came from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, to uh, see our wedding. The wedding was uh, performed by a Brazilian pastor, and he uh, had his daughters here, and they translated from the Portuguese into English. So it was a multicultural, multilingual service. And it, uh, it was very hot. We did not have air conditioning. And Mrs. Harrison almost uh, fainted during the service. Somebody had to bring the piano bench around for her to sit on because the pastor was long-winded. I'll try not to be so long-winded today. See, the simplest, the simplest message is what I'm going to try for. But uh, there's a big date coming up, and uh, I wanted to talk about the dates. But before I go there, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I invite you, Holy Spirit, to be here with me, and Lord, let it be me. Let it be you working through me, and uh, let these words be pleasing to you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And I'm just going to move this up just to share. There we go. That's better. So this is an interesting date. It's not the date that you mentioned. Uh, it actually is uh, September 3rd. 1967. Uh, very important date. No, that wasn't my birthday. I was probably uh, probably as old as the, the little baby over there on uh, September 3rd, 1967. But uh, this was a big date. This was uh, spoken about in the news. It was for what was going on national news. And I bet most people here have never even heard of this. Probably because the first hint is you see that the date is not in an American format. It's actually in a European style. And that should give you the hint that what was going on was happening somewhere in Europe. It actually was happening in Sweden, of all places. And this date was called H-Day. And it was a very big deal. Look at all these happy people. They're all in their finest dressed up, they're all ready for each day, they're smiling, they're, uh... So what do you think this was all about? It was a big thing, there was a lot of public service announcements, there were even cartoons that the kids were, would see, they were talking about each day, and I see somebody looking at this up online. <laughs> You'll find out in a minute. Um, they had, they mentioned in the cartoons, they had a, there was a song that talked about each day, that was a popular song. It even made it into the like the top 40 in Swedish radio. Uh, the, this was something going on for quite a long time, well over a year before September 3rd of 1967. They even had H-Day undies and H-Day socks. What could this have possibly been? So much going on. Everybody knew about H Day. It was coming up. We have a garden. This is all planted. If you read Swedish, you might have a, a little better chance at what was going on. Here's a hint. This was from a, another uh, advertisement at the time. The idea, of course, is going to be those arrows on our glasses. What do you think that would mean? What was going on on H Day in 1967? Well, this is the event right here. This is it happening. What's going on is the cars are changing from the left side of the road to the right side of the road. 
Sweden drove on the left, just like in the UK. And the rest of Europe drove on the right. And at the border with, between Sweden and Finland, there was this weird loopy thing that they had to go through and the signs and all that. And Sweden decided that uh, at one point that it would be much more beneficial for them to switch to driving on the right. And so that was what HA was. September 3rd, a Sunday morning, and that's when they made this decision. It is, um, this is the answer to, uh, when somebody, this is my answer, when somebody talks about the Sunday question. Because if you're going to do something like this, something, a big deal, something that changes laws, something that changes this international kind of a affair, you don't hide it. It's not a secret. You tell the world. You tell everybody. Let me show you how telling the world looks back in the time of Christ. This right here, that's the Rosetta Stone. It is a, it's a big thing. It's about this big. It's in the uh, British Museum in London. And this uh, has a decree from, uh, this is the King Ptolemy V. And this is uh, 196 BC. And it's written in three languages. You see at the very top, uh, hieroglyphs. The second one is Demotic. And the third one is uh, Ancient Greek. And the idea is they communicated a message. They needed to tell the world. This is what happened when a king needed to tell the world something is going on. And so for me, when I hear somebody talk about Saturday, Sunday switchover, I say, where are the headlines? Where are those H-Day undies? Where are the, uh, the all of the H-Day gardens and the H-Day advertisements? Where's all of that? Where is it hidden? Where are Christ's words in red letters in the New Testament saying we're changing from one day to the next? They're just not there. This is a, a headline that's not present. Let's, let's take a look at some other ways, though, that uh, this, some other parts of this message, things this way it was communicated. It was given to everybody. Children heard the H day message. Why would you tell a child? Why would you make a cartoon about this? Because the kids would tell their parents. They talked about it at school. What about people that, uh, homemakers, and of course in 1967 in Sweden they would have been referred to as the Swedish equivalent of housewives. They would take their kids to school, bring them back home, go to the market, come home, go to church, come home. What did they need to know? They needed to know what was on this sign. They needed to know on September 3rd that they needed to change signs. That was all they really needed to know. There was nothing more. What about engineers? Did they need to know something different, a different message for an engineer? You can be certain that traffic engineers, electrical engineers, civil engineers, all kinds of engineers, they kind of had blueprints, a stack of blueprints that thick. There was all kinds of stuff going on. What about the lawmakers? They had a very different take on what was going on. So the message was different for each group of people. Business owners, if you had a small business, you needed to know if the cars could still get into your lot. What if you were in the insurance industry? You needed to know how the accidents were going to affect you. There is so many things. Even if you were part of the, uh, the town and you had buses, guess what? You can't use a bus with the door on the wrong side to pick people up. So all these little things would affect people in different ways. It had reached them in different manners. The one thing that was solid all the way through was what you see here. That symbol. And all the information without the date and without the core concept of what was happening. Everything else was pointless. Different messages for different people. It's what we deal with when, we, when we're Christians. We think we have the message for somebody. We share one message. But sometimes somebody needs to hear a different message. Sometimes the message needs to be communicated in a different way. 
There's a saying in uh, film, I see Andrew, glad to see you made it. Um, Andrew studied film, and anybody who studied film will have heard the expression, show, don't tell. Did you ever hear that? Yeah, many times in class, that was the basis for a lot of our projects. Yeah, show, don't tell. What that means is don't have all kinds of dialogue where you're describing something. Let it happen on the screen, and everybody will see it. This is a tenet of film. Sometimes in our Christian walk, we can show and not tell and be just as effective as somebody else. I can say this personally that, that back in that day, I mentioned the date that uh, my wife and I were married in this church. The reason we were married, the reason I was baptized in the Seventh-day Adventist Church was not because of a profound argument made by Mrs. Harrison talking about uh, all the verses and comparing them side by side. We did some of that. That was important. But there was something else that was just as important. And that is, I saw Janilzi Harrison, well at the time, Shagas Kavali. I saw her, I said something about her that I want to be part of. Not just the, I'm in love with her part, but there was something in her character that I saw, the way she carried herself, the decisions she made, the things she did not want to do, that others would do. And I said, I want to be part of that. The message has many ways of being transmitted. I'm going to shift gears right now. That right there is a Marine. There was a uh, young fellow named uh, James Dixon, who was uh, his... Uh, in high school in uh, May of 1965. And he and his friend, they went to uh, go see about getting into the army. They wanted to become helicopter pilots. And the reason was the Vietnam War was really ramping up. And they knew at that time, military service was obligatory. They were all going to be drafted. And they knew that if they were drafted, they would have no say in their future. They would go to the infantry. And they thought, if I can go be a helicopter pilot, that's going to be really cool. Well, James uh, Jim was colorblind, no helicopter pilot. And his buddy stuck with them, so they both decided they wouldn't go. And they're walking out of there thinking, how are we going to do it? And he walked by the Marine recruiter, who called him over and talked to him, told him a, boat, a whole bunch of bald faced lies and some half-truths, and the next thing they knew, the both of them were going to be Marines. Now, they were going to go to boot camp in the end of the summer. They spent that summer working in a uh, troop training service, and the summer flew by because, of course, they knew they were leaving home for a long, long time. And they went to boot camp on uh, Labor Day weekend, 1965. This was a, they went on Friday. And after a bunch of hurry up and wait, they, led, they eventually ended up on Paris Island. And there, was, uh, there were three drill sergeants that uh, were going to pound them into shape. They taught them everything. They were taught how to use a fork and a spoon. They were taught how to brush their teeth. They were taught everything because the military teaches you from the ground up. They expect you to know nothing. You walk in. Well, something had happened as they were getting prepared to go to the camp. They got a letter saying the war was so intense that the Marine Corps needed more Marines and they didn't have time to train them for 12 weeks. So boot camp was going to be cut to 10 weeks. And then when they got in there, their drill instructor said, well, it's going to be different. We have to get you through in eight weeks because, again, the needs of the Marine Corps. Now, the drill instructors, the three of them, two of them took that, well, they gave them all kinds of trouble, but uh, you can imagine. Anybody who's ever been in the service knows that you learn a whole new language you never even knew existed and a whole way of dealing with things. Uh, very interesting. They had a good time there, I'm sure. One of, for one of those drill instructors, his name was... Uh, Sergeant Land, he did not consider them fully Marines. 
in his mind, they would forever be two-thirds Marines because they did not go through all the training. At the very end, after they did, went through their, their eight weeks and they finished, they'd done various parts of their training, they had had their graduation, they were getting on the bus. The two other drill instructors were there seeing them off and they waved goodbye to everyone to the next duty station. But Sergeant Land did not go there. He did not think that they were real Marines. They had not finished the full training. And he was right to some extent. They went to their uh, classes and stuff, their schools. Uh, the one gentleman I'm talking about, this uh, gentleman, Jim Dixon, he went to be a, a military policeman. And so he went to uh, MP school. That was going to be like four months or something. And throughout the school, throughout the training, the instructors were expecting him to know things. And every once in a while, they would find a hole in his knowledge because we didn't do that part. Oh, we skipped that. Oh, we had to cut that out. Training was not as complete as it could have been. He did have, uh, he did have one point, though, that he made. He, he said, and this is, uh, I know these things because uh, Jim Dixon wrote his memoirs. He kept a, uh, a journal that he was in the service. He eventually published them a few years ago in a book. So the end of the story, he lives. And he, uh, he wrote down that when Sergeant Land said they were not fully Marines, he said, well, they might not be real Marines, but in a few months, some of them were going to be real dead. And he was right about that. The Marines changed the rules out of necessity. They were changed to benefit the authority that made the rules. It was done for expediency. It was done to achieve a goal. God want to change the rules? What do you think about that? Doesn't God? He's the king. The king of the universe. He made us. And he wants more than anything to be able to change the rules. To say, sin is not a problem. He wants to be able to take us back. He wants all of us. Every single one of us. But let's take a look at this, this verse here. Numbers 23, verse 19. Tell us a little bit about God. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? He can't change the rules. God can't do what the United States Marine Corps did. God cannot alter his laws for anyone's convenience, not even his own. In the Patriarchs and Prophets, it says this. Since the divine law is as sacred as God himself, only one equal with God can make an atonement for its transgression. None but Christ could redeem fallen man from the curse of the law and bring him again into harmony with heaven. Christ would take upon himself the guilt and shame of sin, sin so offensive to a holy God that it must separate the Father and his Son. Christ would reach the depths of misery to rescue the ruined race. If God had changed the rules, even the slightest, in order to allow us to not suffer the consequences of sin, Sergeant Land would be standing there pointing each one of us and saying, you're not a real Christian. Let's take a look at James 1, verse 17. Whatever is good, gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. That last little bit, he never changes or casts a shifting shadow. Solid. Always the same. If God changed the rules, there would be an accusing finger pointing at God saying he played favorites and he was a hypocrite. Most of all, it's not his nature to do so. Over the next few months, uh, Private Dixon went to school to be a military policeman. It was about four months. And he spent several months in that capacity in Vietnam. He, uh, 
He was a lance corporal by the time he came out of, of that particular part of his uh, career. Um, he was doing police work. He was uh, making sure people didn't get in trouble, that kind of thing, and guarding stuff. There were a special unit that was just military police. Well, at some point, the Marines said, we need people to go into combat from this non-combatant unit. And they started taking people from his military police unit. And over time, his friends, the ones who'd been in, in there longer, they all got transferred into combat units. And one day, his turn came up, and he knew the next day, he and his three friends, or his two friends, they were going to go to a combat unit. His two friends were Corporal Carden and Corporal McDonald, and they were going to be sent to combat the first time. So the day before they left the MP unit, Lance Corporal Dixon asked one of the uh, other Marines, one of the uh, MPs who had been in combat, he said, come here, I've got a question for you. We're going to go, we're going to, to the combat zone. Okay. What can you tell us? What do we need to know? What's going to happen? And the answer was not an answer he really wanted to hear. The guy looked at him and said, well, one of you will probably get killed. One of you will be wounded. And one of you should be okay. The words were prophetic. Of the three friends, Corporal Carter was injured and he was hospitalized twice. They uh, took him to uh, Japan, to the hospital, and he was or to Okinawa, sorry, to the hospital on two separate occasions. He, was re he recovered both times, went back to his unit. The fact that he went back to combat means he didn't lose anything by it. He wasn't seriously injured. He eventually made it home. Uh, James Dixon came home after his tour with a few scratches and cuts. Uh, they tried to give him a, a Purple Heart, which is the award if you're wounded in combat. And he said, I don't want that, I don't deserve it. He wasn't really injured that badly. Came home and spent the, the rest of his uh, working career as a uh, junior high school teacher. And then he, he wrote his memoirs. On May 26th of 1967 though, with, uh, with his orders to go home, two days later in his pocket, Corporal Gerald McDonald was killed in enemy action at the age of 19. His name is on this wall. You can find it, panel 20E for East, line 122. This weekend we honor the fallen in our country who served our country. The comments I make, they're about the Vietnam War, and that's mainly because, not because any of the others are less important, it's because it's the one that was part of my childhood. This was the war that was on TV every night, all the news. My dad went to Vietnam, not in country, he was on a ship offshore. And uh, my teachers, the male teachers in, in high school, many of them had served in Vietnam. So this was the backdrop of people who grew up in the 1970s and it shaped a lot of our country. But uh, it doesn't necessarily mean the others, anything about the others. So I do have a, uh, I have a, a homework assignment, should you accept it. And that is, someday if you ever find yourself in Washington, D.C., and we all live in New Jersey, we're two and a half hours away from there. Sometimes family members are, are visiting and we say, can we go see the White House or something? Walk up to the wall. This is the Vietnam Memorial. Be quiet, respectful. Put your hand on the wall. Touch it. Feel the names. They're engraved in there. It's granite. It is shaped in a V shape. At the ends, the wall is very short. And in the middle, you can see this person is there. It's very tall. There's, today, there's 58,320 names. And I can say 58,312 boys because almost everybody who died was a teenager, and there were eight women on that wall. All the rest were men, because that's the way it was. It was a sign of the times. Every single one of them died in Vietnam. Read a few of them, read the names out loud, and think about 
what that boy's life was like, what happened. Think about teenagers you know today. They're just thinking about probably, if there are any boys like the teenagers I know, they probably wouldn't know how to drive yet. They're probably not sure what they want to do in life. That's what these guys were all about. Most of them had never planned on going to another country and being involved in a war for people who were not having to fight the war themselves. There's a lot of pacifists, definitely in Europe, I can assure you. And there are many pacifists who are on that wall. Conscientious objectors, that was the term of art at the time. I don't know if that's what they call them today, but if you're a conscientious objector, what that meant was you did not carry a rifle, but that did not mean you did not go to war. What happened was they would put you in a non-combatant role. Quite often, you would end up as a medic, a combat medic or a corpsman, both of them the same thing, people offering aid to soldiers who have fallen, but that meant you were in the most dangerous place and you were a target. One priest wrote the following of a letter to the New York Times. As a priest of the Orthodox Church who writes on religion and culture, I am hardly a missionary for the Seventh-day Adventists. In the Vietnam War, however, I served as an army medic with many SPAs, as they were called. As conscientious objectors, these young men refused to bear arms, but agreed to serve as medical personnel. Most often, Seventh-day Adventists were sent to combat units where without even a sidearm, they crawled directly into enemy fire to patch the wounded and retrieve the dead. Their casualty rates were among the highest of the war. There are names of the Seventh-day Adventists etched in the wall of the Vietnam Memorial. Their memory is seared into those hapless cynics who served with them. They were the bravest, most committed, most heroic Americans I have ever known. At least 148 American Seventh-day Adventist military personnel lost their lives in the Vietnam War. The number's probably higher because people didn't put down on the form Seventh-day Adventist. They would put down Protestant. Or maybe they would not write down what they were. Or maybe they weren't sure of what they were. There are many reasons. 148 who wrote down, I am Seventh-day Adventist. One other thought, that number 148 seems modest when you compare it to the 58,320 names on the wall. But when you compare the losses with the impact on the communities of people, as a percentage of the U.S. Adventist community in 1970, the 148 fatalities point to a greater and keener sacrifice than was experienced by the general population. More Adventists probably either know or were related to a young man who died in Vietnam than was true for the rest of America. Something that impacted Adventist life more than most Americans. The message that I have is really the simplest one. Those 58,320 individuals did not need a deep study. They did not need to know the 2,300-year prophecy. They did not need to know about the sanctuary service. They did not need to know about the symbolism of Daniel and Revelation. They did not need to know about the nuances of the works and the law. They did not need to know about the placement of a comma in Christ's words on the cross. They're all important topics and they have a time and place. But these folks have one pressing need. They need to know the simplest of things. They need to know that God loves all of us, even the enemy. All of us, more than anything else. They need to know that God wants all of us to have everlasting life. Everybody. Everlasting life. So much that he's the only thing gave his son, his only son, his son, fully human, fully God, to pay that price in full. A blemish-free sacrifice that we did not deserve. They needed to know that they were born, already paid for, 
for the sin they already had. They needed to know it's already ours. There's no conditions about being good enough. We just have to accept it. That's what those men and women needed to know. As the enemy had them in their sights, as the helicopters fell in flames, as they tripped over the wire that exploded the mine, as they died of hunger in captivity. The only message that we need to know is this one. Our closing hymn is 191, Love Divine.